Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkash. 75 years ago, the world was coming out of the worst conflict in human history. To mark the beginning of a new era of global cooperation, the United Nations was formed. Its mission to mobilize the world to tackle its most pressing challenges. Challenges like the deadliest pandemic in a century. The UN General Assembly recently convened its 75th session as the death toll from the coronavirus neared 1 million. Facing the greatest crisis since the very war the UN was born from, the global body has been criticized for its inability to act. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said that the UN had failed to respond adequately to the pandemic. He also singled out its failure to end conflicts and help those fleeing oppression in places like Syria, Yemen and Libya. So has the UN outgrown its usefulness? Has the rapid spread and devastation by the coronavirus exposed the need for real reforms? And to answer that from Istanbul, I'm joined by Talha Kyose, who is an associate professor of political science and international relations at Ibn Haldun University. And from Rome, Marco Cornelos, who is Italy's former ambassador to the United Nations. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program at the virtual meeting of the 75th UNGA uh, coronavirus pandemic, tensions between the US and China and regional conflicts dominated the agenda. So Marco, could you walk us through this year's meeting and how it was different than the previous ones? Well, it was quite different because nobody was there. And it's, it's quite a big difference in the sense that the pandemic compelled everybody to be connected with the UN in remote, as uh, millions and millions, maybe billions of people are accustoming themselves because of the pandemic to work on remote. Uh, even the top leaders of the planet uh, have been compelled to, to uh, be connected uh, uh, from remote inside the UN building when I've been many times in the early 2000s. I have to rectify, I was not an ambassador, I was one of the top officials in the Middle East at the Italian mission at the UN. And uh, there's a very, very limited number of people. Mm -hmm. uh, social distancing is affecting also inside the, the UN building, as we can see from the images and the mask. And everything has changed. And uh, a small virus coming... Uh, in a from, good way uh, or in a bad way, you think? Well, listen. The pandemic has been something very, very cruel in a way, because uh, there are so many people affected, there's so many economies disrupted. Uh, there's only there's only one small uh, good effect in the sense that people are traveling less, are uh, polluting less, uh, uh, in a way are uh, staying more inside with their families. Uh, I don't want to say that this is a, 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 it's good at all, but in a way there's also a positive effect. What is important is to take the right lessons from mm -hmm. this situation and improve, uh, reinforce multilateralism and international cooperation. So if we will not be able to do that in these circumstances, I mean, in this way, the world leaders are failing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to touch on multilateralism, but Talha, one of uh, Turkish President Erdogan's um, most popular slogans has been that the world is bigger than five, meaning that the UN Security Council with its five members is outdated and unable to tackle the problems of today's world. So has the UN's weakness during the pandemic proved his point? Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, there are so many problems uh, within the United Nations system. And one of the issues definitely is the configuration of the Security Council. However, besides the Security Council, there is declining interest and declining trust in the United Nations system. So we have been engaging, dealing with the problem of the pandemic. We have been dealing with the environmental issues, global warming. So now the global leaders, especially the founders of the United Nations and uh, the permanent members of the uh, Security Council are no more committed to the United Nations. So uh, Trump's uh, talk was just eight minutes and he mentioned uh, the American interest and he just threatened uh, the country is that uh, the U.S. Uh, has been facing problems. So actually, this should be the ground for multilateralism and engaging with the global crisis that affects all the people. The similar situation for Putin's talk and uh, Xi's talk. So unfortunately, the leaders 
uh, rather than emphasizing the multilateralism and cooperation and reforming the United Nations for the purpose of uh, future uh, problems, uh, they mentioned their country's own interest. And this is a, a frightening uh, issue because the number of uh, problems we have been uh, dealing are increasing. So the immigration yes. issues, global warming, and all these problems are mounting and there is less commitment, especially from the leaders that establish this uh, yeah. organization. Yeah, it, it just previously mentioned, Marco, during the early stages of the pandemic, many countries were acting unilaterally to combat the virus, whether it was buying supplies or sharing information. So why do you think the United Nations failed to take a leading role in providing a multilateral platform for countries to cooperate? Uh, there's a, a big misunderstanding here. I listen many times uh, uh, expression like United Nations fail. We should uh, uh, take into account that the United Nations works only when the five permanent members of the United Nations allow the organization to work. Yes. But because of their rivalries, uh, there's nothing the UN can do if the five permanent members of the Security Council disagree among themselves. So the reform of Security Council to be more uh, uh, reflecting better the current international reality is overdue. Is overdue since they are discussing the topic since at least 30 years, since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's disagreement. Uh, there are some countries, some big countries now in the international stage that may be because of their economy their political role, their population uh, would have much more rights or to say something more meaningful about international peace and security. That is one of the main topics of the United Nations. There are other issues that the United Nations is covering, uh, humanitarian issue, development, where the organization has been effective all along the last decades, where it has failed. It's on peace of security, but because peace of security is linked perversely to what the Security Council decides according to the will of five permanent members that are there since 1945. Mm -hmm. But many leaders around the world, Talha, uh, want there should be a structural reforms to the United Nations if there are going to be structural reforms. Who would oversee them? Who will decide the UN Security Council again? Um, well, I think it the, would not. Talha, please. Mm -hmm. And the main ground should be uh, the UN General Assembly. However, uh, we don't see enthusiasm, especially from the permanent members in the General Assembly. So they do not really try to open the gate for reforms, especially the influential countries. And there are some other uh, initiatives coming from Germany, Brazil, India. They are also. Uh, you know, uh, disturbed from the current situation and dysfunctional nature of the uh, United Nations, despite there are some achievements in humanitarian areas, in, uh, NGOs and coordination uh, in some areas, the main uh, political problem, actually, uh, the main political issues and dealing with the violent uh, you know, conflict has not been touched in a proper manner. So there is actually an interest, uh, there is some, uh, you know, uh, efforts to integrate new actors in a more effective way. However, there is a resistance. So it should be tackled in the General Assembly, but General Assembly does not have that many power okay. uh, for the moment. So, Marco, how could Trump's re-election uh, impact the United Nations? Because we already know that he cut up funding for the WHO, UNESCO, he threatened NATO allies, he withdrew from the Paris climate agreement. So what could his re-election mean for multilateralism? Well, first of all, we have to see if he will be re-elected first. Secondly, uh, unfortunately, I believe that we are not going to know who is going to be the president of the United States uh, on the evening or early morning of uh, November 3rd, because the um, result could be highly contested by yeah. both sides. Yeah. Uh, third, uh, and we could have months before knowing who is going to be the American president, who the American uh, uh, people decided to uh, decided as president. Uh, 
My hope is that once Trump is reelected, he will relax a little bit. Maybe he will become a little bit more cooperative because now he has achieved what he was looking for. And maybe he will consider that some form of multilateralism, effective multilateralism, will be much more helpful to solve some of the most important problems uh, uh, in the planet, starting from the pandemic, of course, but also to promote the condition for more peace of security in the Middle East, uh, hopefully not in the way that is doing currently, uh, especially against the Palestinians. And at the same time, I believe that also the issue of climate change could be resumed in a very cooperative way between the top uh, let's say, polluters in the world. In this sense, I believe that the cooperation between the United States and China and other Asian countries is extremely important with the European Union to uh, try to see if at least climate change is an issue that could be uh, discussed again with some more effective measures. All right. Unfortunately, gentlemen, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. Turkey's defense industry was once a fledgling sector with only a few dozen companies. Now it boasts well over a thousand firms. In less than two decades, Turkey has transformed itself from a massive arms importer to a major innovator and global exporter. That major leap was reflected in seven Turkish companies making the world's top 100 global defense list. So what types of military hardware is the country developing? Haider Abbasi explains. Showing off the next generation in weapon systems, this armoured vehicle can carry out anti-tank and surveillance missions and can operate on land and in water. It's made by Turkish manufacturer FNSS. The company has made it into the world's top 100 defence firms as ranked by the magazine Defence News. FNSS is one of seven Turkish suppliers on the list. We asked its CEO how Turkish defense firms have grown so rapidly. It is a result of uh, a very good strategy uh, established by, by the state uh, 35, 40 years ago, uh, following uh, the uh, embargo uh, imposed on Turkey after uh, Cyprus uh, event. Uh, I think we have decided to grow defense industries. So that resulted in establishment of uh, SSM then, now it is SSP, uh, with correct strategies supported by all the stakeholders uh, in the country. And of course with uh, the synergy between the state and the private sector, uh, I think we, we come a long way and uh, we have achieved this uh, significant result. In 2002, there were only 56 defense and aerospace companies in Turkey. Today, there are more than 1,500. In that time, industry revenue rose from $1 billion to nearly $11 billion. This growth means Turkey is now emerging as a major exporter of arms and has seen demand rise from countries like Pakistan and Malaysia. Foreign customers say they're attracted to Turkey's high technological standards and competitive pricing. For decades, Turkey's been importing most of its military hardware, but that's all changing. The government says its reliance on foreign defense systems is now only 30%. And President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says he wants to end this dependency completely by 2023, the centennial of the Turkish Republic. Turkey's military is the second largest in the NATO Defense Alliance, with more than 350,000 active personnel. Right now, it's operating in several countries, including Syria and Iraq, and with such an extensive reach, the government believes it's essential to have a self-reliant defense industry. Ultimately, Ankara's aim is to be a leader in the field, competing with major players like the United States and Germany. And if the progress of the last two decades is anything to go by, it seems the sky's the limit. Heyda Abbasi, Straight Talk, Istanbul. And joining me now is John Kasabolu, who is the director of the Defense and Security Program at the Istanbul-based think tank EDAM, and from Stockholm, Peter Wiseman, who is a senior researcher with the 
Cypri arms and military expenditure program. So, gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. John, what was the main driving force behind Turkey's push to develop its defense industry? Well, I can rank three main drivers. One is the strategic trauma following the 1974 uh, military intervention to Cyprus, because Turkey faced enormous arms embargoes, uh, including those from its uh, NATO allies. Uh, so the idea of developing an indigenous arms industry was really important. And since then, it still holds this uh, utmost importance in the eyes of the Turkish elite. Uh, the second thing is, uh, making a strategic sector, especially as to arms. Uh, back in 2002, it was only two and, uh, two and, uh, 250 million US dollars, uh, Turkish defense exports. Uh, now the threshold is $3 billion. Uh, it is fast becoming a, a strategic sector. And last, uh, an indigenous uh, arms sector gives Turkish political decision makers a room to maneuver, especially in uh, cross-border operations, as we have seen in the northern Syria, uh, this march de manel is giving uh, space uh, for Turkish uh, governments uh, to use uh, its military toolbox uh, more frequently in addressing regional security threats. Uh, so in 2002, uh, Peter, there were only uh, 56 defense companies in Turkey. Today, there are more than 1,500. So um, where do you think Turkey stands when it comes to other major arms exporters like the United States and Germany? Well, I think that Turkey has rapidly developed into a country that can do a lot more than it could in the past. It can do a lot more than just producing ammunition, rockets, missiles, and maybe a few basic armored vehicles. It is now in a phase where it can produce uh, increasingly sophisticated items, items such as small, light UAVs, uh, items such as more sophisticated um, armored vehicles, even tanks are now being designed in Turkey itself, although, and this is very important, continuously still with a lot of foreign input. So where is Turkey now compared to, let's say, Germany or France or the UK? Well, it is by far not that far. Turkey doesn't have the industrial capacity and also, you could argue, not yet the um, military spending levels that you need to get to the point that you can build an arms industry as sophisticated and comprehensive as you can see in the major European Con con countries, let alone, of course, compared to Russia, China and the USA. Uh, the USA. Yeah. So, yeah. so, John, how dependent is Turkey on foreign manufacturers and how long it is before Turkey um, will have a self-reliant defense industry? What are the challenges? What are the setbacks before the Turkish industry? Well, that, that's a great question because this is widely speculated in Turkey, especially as to domestic politics. On one side, we see some claiming that Turkish defense industry is completely getting independent which is not possible. Even the, the big hats in the sector is not completely in, in, independent. And it is not needed. The sustainability of international collaboration is needed. And Turkey, as to many systems and subsystems, is running a sustainable uh, international collaboration. We see that in the burgeoning defense relations between Turkey and Ukraine. We have long seen that in Turkish-South Korean defense relations and once in the 1990s, Turkish-Israeli uh, defense relations. Yet there is a second segment, which is the strategic weapon systems, uh, especially looming large in the Turkish case with uh, long-range high-altitude air and missile defense or uh, the fifth-generation aircraft projects like TFX National Combat Aircraft or the S-400 case or the Turkish Eurosam cooperation for a long-range high-altitude air and missile defense system. But as to this high-end weaponry, we still in Turkey have a need for international collaboration. I think that would be the biggest challenge for Turkish defense industry in the coming decades, mm -hmm. uh, to address uh, strategic dependence uh, on the foreign collaborators as to strategic weapon systems. So, um, Peter, uh, so uh, to which extent Turkey needs foreign cooperation and how Turkey's foreign relations affect its potential? How has the purchase of S-400s from Russia impacted uh, Turkey's defense industry because it was excluded from the F-35 program? 
I think it's extremely important for a country like Turkey and for basically all countries in the world, except for maybe then the USA, Russia and potentially China in the future, to have very strong relation with other states to, to be able to together or with the input of the larger state continuing uh, to, 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 to be able to both uh, develop and produce the kind of high tech systems that, 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 that one wants to have. I mean, a clear example is, again, uh, Turkey wants to build a tank. Mm -hmm. um, it has good mm -hmm. relations with Germany. Those relations then sour and suddenly Turkey cannot build that tank anymore because it does not have access to the engine yes. it needs yes. to do so. That's a very clear example of the extreme dependence of con con countries like Turkey uh, on foreign technology and foreign know-how. So, Turkey, we all know that, lives in a dangerous neighborhood, John. How has regional instability impacted the development of Turkey's arm industry? Uh, actually, I think the hybrid threats emanating from Turkish Middle Eastern doorstep uh, sparked uh, the, the, the motivation among the Turkish political military elite uh, to develop such arms. We have seen since Operation Euphrates Shield back in 2016 up until uh, today in the four large episodes of Turkey's expeditionary campaigns in Syria, uh, the involvement of Turkish national arms grew and grew. Uh, actually, that was something that also sparked Turkish uh, arms exports because this problematic threat landscape at Turkey's Middle Eastern doorstep enabled Turkish arms industry to produce combat uh, weaponry. A combat proven characteristic is really important. It is a reference, it is a major reference in selling arms. And it, it also, I think, helped uh, Turkish uh, defense firms uh, to market uh, their solutions and their products uh, because they were used in uh, one of the most dangerous battlefields of the, uh, of the world. Uh, second, the Turkish arms really scored uh, sensational achievements like the hunt for panzers, for instance, state of the art. Russian mobile low to mid altitude uh, air defense system, uh, Turkish drones hunted uh, panzers not only in Syria but also in Libya. Uh, and that resonates really sensationally with international strategic community, which translates into both arms export success and better feedbacks from the end user, in which case the Turkish armed forces. Uh, I think uh, as Turkey's neighborhood uh, keeps its problematic character and get, getting even worse, uh, I think Turkish uh, arms industry follows it uh, and produce more combat proven systems, more smart uh, solutions. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and I think the, 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 the importer countries like Azerbaijan will keep this combat proven characteristics through other conflicts. All right. um, it's not just Turkey, Peter. The global arms industry is uh, exploding, especially between the United uh, States and China. Are we entering a new global arms race? As a researcher, I'm always very careful with the, the term arms race, but yeah, I'm afraid we may have to use the term just only to raise the alert to say that, yes, there are a number of regions where we can see that countries are uh, increasing their military spending and increasing their arms procurement vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other, whether that's in the mid Middle East, whether that's in the Gulf region, whether that's in uh, Southeast Asia, in the, Ch in the South China Sea, but of course also whether that is between the two major powers in the world, China and the US. Uh, we do see a worrying trend in which the uh, availability of military resources, military spending has become an increasingly important mm. uh, aspect mm. of foreign and security policy in the world. So, John, which markets does the Turkish defense industry have an eye on? and what it offers to other countries? Well, so far, especially in Turkish unmanned systems exports, we have seen uh, good achievements in lucrative markets. Turkey entered the Gulf market through Qatar. Uh, the Ukrainian market was really important because, because Ukraine's defense and technological industrial base is a post-Soviet one uh, and a developing one. Uh, so entering Ukrainian market uh, with Turkish drones uh, was really important. I think from now on, Turkey eyes uh, the Asian markets. Uh, we know that the Indonesians show, import, uh, show attention in Turkey's uh, submarine modernization plans. Uh, Pakistan is a natural market for Turkey. Malaysia as well is a natural market for Turkey. So Asia will be really important. 
Uh, and recently, Turkey also, especially after the recent clashes between Azerbaijan and Armenian formations, Turkey entered Azerbaijan's drone market. Uh, it was also a promising achievement because Azerbaijani unmanned uh, military systems market is dominated by Israel, which is one of the big hats in, in the industry. But from now on, especially as the Turkish administration put the threshold of $3 billion of defense exports, I see Asia uh, becoming the new rising star uh, for the Turkish arms exports. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. I appreciate it a lot. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Subarkaj. If you've got any comments, follow us and tweet us at Straight Talk TRT. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.